So, <coughs> we're going to go into Jesus' sacrifice for us. And uh, hmm. Somehow this oh. Huh. <laughs> Me and computers, I guess. Um, I forgot how to advance it. So Isaiah is a chapter in the Bible in chapter 53 verse 10 the whole chapter talks about Jesus the Messiah God sending the Messiah and I'll just read it again yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him now I don't know the Hebrew for that word bruise but he was really bruised I mean Jesus' crucifixion is suffering that was really uh, what but it reminds me that Satan's head is bruised Satan's destroyed so in a sense this word bruise actually means a lot more and I refer to in Genesis when it says that the woman's seed is going to bruise your head and you're going to bruise his heel kind of thing so he had put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So, what I'm hoping is that when we get done looking at this, we will realize what a great salvation Jesus is. It's a great salvation. And that only Jesus, Jesus gives this salvation. And really, to those that have not been born again, who have not believed and gotten born again, our message is repent and believe. So that's something just to keep in the back of your mind. That this is sort of the purpose of this, for us to really be ready to give an answer of what the hope that lies within us, to be able to communicate to others really what the gospel is, what a treasure it is, what, what a magnificent thing it is. So, we start out with Adam in the garden. Just going to read from Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 15. And the Lord God took the man, Adam, and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die it is interesting that he told this to Adam Eve he hadn't created yet Eve is later so Either Adam told Eve about this or else God told him again but God spoke to Adam and gave this commandment so let's take a look at Adam before he sinned spiritually Adam was neutral but he had a free will he has no spiritual DNA and Adam doesn't have a conscience. <clears throat> what happens is, if you think about it, it's like, what is a conscience? What is a conscience? Well, they talk about a moral conscience. Basically, a conscience is, I can discern and say well this is good this is what should be done and this is evil this is what shouldn't be done so I have a conscience of this is good and this is evil so it seems to me that Adam 
It's like sort of an analogy would be taste. This is vanilla and this is chocolate. And if I have no taste, I can taste vanilla and I can taste chocolate and I can't tell the difference, you see? So, what happens is, Adam has a free will and he chooses to disobey God. So he rebels against God and he eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as God had said, he immediately dies spiritually. He no longer has fellowship with God because God's light and in him is no sin, no darkness. And so when you sin, when we sin, we don't have that, we're not in the light and so we don't have that fellowship. He now has a spiritual nature. He has Satan's spiritual DNA and is a son of Satan. He now has a conscience, but it's an evil conscience. Now, I'm going to go back to the analogy of the vanilla and the chocolate. <clears throat> Here you go, children. You can choose a vanilla ice cream cone or a chocolate ice cream cone. And which do you want? But now I'm going to change it. You're a chocolate lover. You really, really like chocolate. And when I give you those options, what are you going to do? You're going to choose chocolate. So Adam got a conscience. He now knows good and he now knows evil, but he got it in sin. And so now he has a conscience, but it's an evil conscience. <clears throat> now, um, the Bible tells us that's what he had. Because it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. So before we get born again, we do have a conscience, but it's evil. And our bodies wash with pure water. So this has to do with that. Now, what was the consequences of Adam's sin? There was what we call the Adamic race. Everybody came from Adam. And everybody's spiritual father is Satan. And everybody is a sin factory. And all are destined for spiritual, eternal death. <clears throat> now some of the scriptures that we know this is true is Psalm 51 verse 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus is talking to the Jewish people there, the Pharisees and things, and he says, ye are of your father the devil. He didn't mean the physical. He didn't mean the parent, the physical DNA from the father, the physical DNA from the mother. He said the spiritual, as it were, DNA. Your father is Satan, is the devil. And then it goes on in the lust and your father you would do. <clears throat> and um, in terms of knowing that everybody's going into the lake of fire, as was read a little earlier by Joel, we know that, and <clears throat> it's interesting that I hadn't really thought so much, but if you were you were on a website and they said, here's a quiz, a biblical quiz, you know. <laughs> Would you be able to know the principles of the doctrine of Christ? The principles of the doctrine of Christ. Oh, yeah, right, sure. One, two, yeah. 
Are they like right? Anyway, the, the principles of the doctrine of Christ, basically it's the foundation of our faith. Paul says, well, do we have to go back to the principles of the, you see, it's like we should be moving on here. But basically, if we don't know the principles, if we don't know what the foundation of Jesus Christ and what has happened, then we're, we're you know, we're asking mom for the milk. You know, we, we need to get some of this in us. So leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrines of action, and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. So Hebrews 6, chapter 6, verses 1 to 2, it, it, you see, this is the truth that basically is the two by four hit in the, the forehead of sinners. You are going to be raised from the dead and there's going to be eternal judgment. In Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Now, we have God's answer. God's answer is Jesus. <clears throat> he is spiritually alive. He is in fellowship with God. And he has God the Father's spiritual DNA. He's a son of God. And he has a good conscience. <clears throat> the salvation that Jesus brings is a great salvation and this is what needed to be done. What needed to be done was sin, meaning really the sin nature, needed to be condemned and destroyed to allow for a new spiritual birth a new race of men and women on earth. See, we have the Adamic race, but we need a new race. Sins needed to be atoned for, forgiven, remitted, removed, needed to be taken away. And then sp spiritual eternal life needed to be given as compared to eternal death. <clears throat> now we know it's a great salvation because the Bible tells us in Hebrews 2, Chapter 2, verse 3, it says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? So our salvation isn't just a, oh, it's a salvation. It's great. And in 1 Corinthians, we get to understand a little bit about Adam and Jesus. See, Adam, from Adam came the Adamic race. But Jesus was called the last Adam. See, he was made similar to us, but without sin. So that, in that way, he was the last Adam. But he's the second man. He's this new race, as it were. So 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 15, verses 45 to 47. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, which is Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven, Jesus. And then, you see, Jesus is the one who has started this new race, you see. The sons and daughters of God, you see. And it's interesting that in the, um, in the Isaiah scripture it says, he shall see his seed, but he died, you know. So the seed is this, Adam, this is this new race that Jesus is, is over, and so he's called the firstborn of many brethren. So Romans chapter 8 verse 29, for whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Colossians 1 chap, uh, chapter 1 verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And Hebrews 12 chapter 12 verse 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just made men perfect. So, Jesus' salvation is not just 
one day he was in Rome and they crucified him and paid the penalty but he had a complete life of obedience he was tempted like us but his spiritual DNA was that of a son of God to do righteously so he could choose but he he always chose not to sin he took our iniquities upon himself he died in our place he shed his blood for our sins and he defeated death he rose from the dead and was declared to be the son of God who can give eternal life <clears throat> so we know that he took our our iniquities because Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6 and all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all and Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 he took the death we should have but we see Jesus who's made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man in Romans chapter 1 verse 4 talking about Jesus and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead now I'm hoping this section really gets to us because we need to understand about sin the choice is obedience or sin obedience or disobedience and free will allows for obedience so if we didn't have free will then God there wouldn't be any obedience and so let's ask ourselves the question is sin really so bad now the hint here is yes very much so so it, it, I make it easy for this pop quiz here you know you ask a question you know we we like to do that uh, as a, a teachers and stuff so but let's think a little bit about this see do you realize that sinners are extremely biased about sin you ever think about that today's story was exactly it about Absalom if you find any iniquity fine kill me really are you kidding did you just say that I haven't done anything wrong he deserved to I nobody else did amazing amazing so I wasn't there but let's go back into the Garden of Eden and somebody says Adam ate from a tree what's the big deal okay I shouldn't have done I ate I ate from a tree now I know this is going to sound kind of silly but good is good evil is evil but do we really know that what it, Adam chose evil when I choose evil and I suffer the consequences of doing so I'm not a victim I chose that and if I chose that I get these consequences but oh I killed the guy but I I had to run away huh I had to stay in Gershon and then you know finally I come they let me come back but then I can't see the king huh 
Sounds like victimhood. And God doesn't want us to go to hell. But when we choose to reject Jesus, we are choosing to go to hell, the lake of fire. We choose. <clears throat> so, let's go back to the garden again. And so, do you realize that Eve sometimes gets a bad rap, I think, you know. Well, you were deceived. Well, what about Adam? I'm a rebel. I wasn't deceived. I said, no, God, I'm going to eat from that tree. And then what happened? Physical death. That's the first death. Physical death occurred. They, Adam and Eve ultimately physically died. In the Garden of Eden, maybe one day they would have eaten of the Tree of Life and they would have lived forever. I mean, so, but physical death came in. And the thing about sin, he sinned. And so taking away just the idea of the, the, the actual act of taking it and eating, you know, he basically said to God, no. I'm rebelling. I'm going to do what I want to do. And that sin, that disobedience, saying no to God. Imagine all the diseases we have. All the sorrow we have. The curse that the earth has upon it. And all of the horrific sins that have occurred since Adam and Eve. All that because he said, no, I'm going to do it. That was disobedience. And, you know, the sin got so bad on the earth. It got so, so horrific, so bad. People were doing such wicked, wicked things that God said, fine. Everybody in the earth, everybody, everybody is going to die a horrible death. They're going to drown. And the flood came and only eight souls were saved. And everybody else, man, women, and child, children, all drowned and died. He wiped out everybody else because of sin. And because of what Adam did, disobey God, everybody, everybody was absolutely going into the lake of fire forever to be tormented and punished for all the sins that they do in their life. That's all. He just ate. That's what sin is. That's what disobedience is. And this is why pe people are in real trouble who haven't received Jesus, who haven't had him come into their life and they get born again because they're going into the lake of fire. And physical death is the first death. The second death is the eternal death. In Revelation chapter 20 verses 14 to 15, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The book of life is, is the book having everybody's names who got born again. So, consequently, Adam eating the fruit of the tree, eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was a big deal. I mean, there's, there's nothing else. No other sin. Imagine one of your sins does all that. Now, as born-again believers, what is our perspective on sin? Well, sin's not good, of course. But it's not so bad. Is that our perspective? 
Is that how we live our life? Well, of course I don't want to sin, but, you know, it's not so bad. Well, we're commanded by God. In Romans chapter 6, verse 12, it says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the last era. Oh, so God commands me not to sin. Now you see, I've talked about the fact that when you get born again, it's a spiritual new birth. You now have spiritual DNA of God the Father. You are a son of righteousness. You are free from sin. And it's only because you are free from sin that God can now say to you, let not sin reign in your mortal body. Because if you're a sinner, telling a sinner, now don't let sin reign in your body is like saying to a dog, uh, don't bark ever. How successful is that going to be? So he wouldn't tell us something that we can't fulfill. So we are able to sin, but God says, don't let it rain. Don't let you be following that king and obeying that king. You're to obey the king of kings. Now, <clears throat> we're in a spiritual war. How many of you realize we're in a spiritual war? We're in the middle of a spiritual war. There are uh, two kingdoms. There's Jesus' kingdom and there's Satan's kingdom. And we know that from scripture because in Math chap Matthew chapter 12, verse 26, it says, And if sa Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? So right there it says Satan has a kingdom. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So God has a kingdom, Jesus. In Colossians 1:13. It talks about how we're translated out of Satan's kingdom into Jesus' kingdom. It says, who hath delivered us, that's Colossians chapter 1 verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So we have two kings, King Jesus as it were and King Satan, and they have their kingdoms. And it's a spiritual kingdom and it's invisible by the way. It's not somewhere located in Florida and like near Orlando or any, any, any you, know, on, you know, it's a spiritual, so it's invisible. <clears throat> now, let's think about us as believers and, and, and about our obedience, about sinning, okay? <clears throat> Imagine that you are back in time and you live in a kingdom with a king whom you serve. But one day, the king learns from his spies that you are obeying his enemy, the king of another kingdom. But you have an excuse. Ready? Those who are parents know? Okay, why'd you do it? I've got an excuse. And you, you say to the king, Your Majesty. You see it being, I only obey the enemy king once in a while. And mostly I obey you. How do you think your king's going to view that excuse? Are things going to go well for you or poorly? We need to fully get what we've gotten in the birth canal out and born again and understand we can choose. Sin is not some little thing. Our king is not pleased when we sin. And I, I'm talking about things that are obviously walking in the flesh, that people, Christians, will say, oh, well, it's okay. I'm not talking really about like, you know, you're wondering, is the Holy Spirit telling you to go pray for somebody? And you're like, oh, I don't know. And, and then, oh, you later you say, oh, that was it. Oh, Lord, forgive me. I, I should have, you know, trying, you're learning how to walk in the Spirit. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking clearly that 
you know it's wrong and you keep choosing oh you minimize it you you you, you you're doing your CPR on your dead man. Your old man's crucified, and yet you're pumping the chest and saying, well, I think there's a little air in there. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body. And <clears throat> so sin's a big deal, and Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 to 24 says this. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thy eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We're serving King Jesus, period. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 to 29. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be new, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. <clears throat> so, Jesus' salvation Again, it's this complete life of obedience. He took our iniquities, he died in our place, he shed his blood, he defeated death, rose from the dead, and de was declared to be the Son of God who can give eternal life. <clears throat> now, Adam disobeyed, Jesus obeyed. <clears throat> it was important to have this life of obedience. Because we know from 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 to 23, the importance of obedience versus just sacrifices. And Samuel said, this is when he's talking to Saul. Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. <clears throat> so it was this life of obedience. And it was therefore this body was prepared. Jesus in the flesh was prepared. Hebrews 10, 5, chapter 10, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me, pre prepared me. And then Romans chapter 5, verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So Jesus came and lived that life of obedience. And so sin, rebellion, is a big deal. Now Jesus chose to die for us. It was God's will for him. So you realize Jesus chose, he had free will, he chose to die for us. It says, John chapter 10, verses 17 to 18. Wherefore doth my father love me? Because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. And then the Isaiah scripture Yet it pleased, uh, 50, chapter 53, verses 10 and 11, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. So God, this was a prophetic, that God would see what Jesus went through everything and he would say okay you paid the price by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities now a lot of people it seems think well Jesus is blood you know it covers the sins and so if I have more sins then it's covered more and it's but Jesus came to destroy our sin factory Knowing this, this is Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. 
we're not that smart, okay? But we're smart enough to realize if you have something making sin, which is like a body. See, actions come from a body. So sins are coming out. And so the body of sin, the old man, it's our sin nature. It's our spiritual DNA from Satan. We are sinners. And to just think Jesus is going to keep covering with the... He wanted to destroy the sin factory. And that's what happened when he, um, he went to the cross. And the scripture is, is coming up. 1 John 3, 8 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil's sin is from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil is sin. So how do you destroy it? You, you destroy that sin factory. Okay? And we don't, we don't come under condemnation about if we sin. If we're walking in the light, we're walking in the spirit, anything not of faith is sin. Well, that covers a lot. Anything not... So if we sin... We confess our sins and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to keep moving on. But this idea, oh, Jesus paid the penalty for my sins and meanwhile back at the ranch I just live my life like, like the devil and one day I bounce into heaven is absolute a lie. It's an error. <clears throat> and what what is amazing is this. This scripture to me speaks so clearly how Jesus did it. See, there's that Galatians, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Well, physically I wasn't back 2000. I wasn't crucified. So what was spiritually? My old man. My old man was in Christ. Because Christ had the supernatural power to give me eternal life. And the only way I'm going to get eternal life is I have to be born again. I have to be born a son of God. And my son of, son of Satan life has to die. So Jesus put me in him. And he says this in terms of he had this power. John chapter 17 verses 1 to 3. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. This is life eternal that they may know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ. The only way we're going to get eternal life is not to be a son or daughter of Satan. Sons and daughters of Satan are not going to be in heaven. They're going to be with God for all eternity. They're going to be in the lake of fire. So that's why Jesus turned to Nicodemus and says, you've got to be born again. And Nicodemus, thinking in the natural, said, get back into my mother? See, no, spiritually. Spiritually, born of water, which is water baptism, of the Spirit, baptism in the Holy Spirit, and then the power comes down to live the resurrected life. <clears throat> Now, Jesus condemned sin. I looked up the word condemn. Basically, when you were condemned, you were dying. You were going to die. And it's interesting, when we talk about sin, it reminds me that, you know, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus, he really didn't think that Jesus was going to be killed. We don't understand why he did it, whether he was trying to precipitate some political thing or what. We don't know. But the scripture says that when he found out that Jesus was condemned, he went back to the high priest and said, here, take your money back. No. And they go, what is that to us? And they threw it. And he threw it on the ground and then he went and hung himself. And Jesus said to Judas, it would have been better for you if you had never been born. That's pretty much the most 
frightening statement that you could ever imagine. Rather than for you to betray the innocent blood, to betray Jesus, and end up in the lake of fire for all eternity, it would have been better if you had never been born. And Jesus also, about going into the lake of fire, he said, don't fear him who can kill you. So in the natural, that would be, you mean somebody's coming up, they're about to kill me. Jesus said, don't fear him. But fear him who once your body is destroyed can throw your soul into hell, into the lake of fire. Fear him. <clears throat> in Romans chapter 8, verse 3, it says, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So Jesus was made just like us. And I talked about it a little earlier. He was made in the flesh, but he lived his whole life obeying, obeying. So Adam disobeyed, but now the second man comes and he shows sin and condemns sin. Says, nope, a man can live his whole life and obey God, even when told you need to lay down your life for everybody. Are you sure? Three times. Are you sure? Are you sure? Okay. And he did it. And that destroyed sin. That condemned sin. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So he took our death. Satan's holding over us. Well, if you don't do what you want to do, you're going to die. You're not going to get life. You're going to... And so he defeated Satan. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> blood had to be shed. And I'm going to just touch lightly on some of this stuff. The old, the old Covenant, the Old Testament, it was a foreshadowing of what was come. There was Abel's offering versus Cain's offering to God. Now it's kind of interesting because you see, you might feel bad for Cain, which is, our old man feels bad for Cain, but as a son of God, I don't feel bad for Cain. Because the scriptures say in Hebrews, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And then in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, faith comes by hearing. So how did Abel, by faith, offer the correct sacrifice? God told him, offer a lamb, offer an animal, shed the blood, kill life and shed the blood. And he told Cain the same thing because God says, if you didn't, you know, he offered what he wanted to offer. So right from the very, the first two men, after Adam and Eve, in a sense, it, it, it started, what do you got to do to, uh, to offer to God? You need to kill an animal, shed its blood to cover sins. And that's accepted and offering fruit, vegetables, whatever from the ground? No. And as it turned out, it, it mentions that Cain was uh, son of that wicked one, meaning Satan. So he is a son, son of Satan and he kills Abel. It's just true religion or true church and false religion, false churches. That's, they've been killing the true prophets and ever since. <clears throat> and um, salvation, basically, the Israelites were saved out of Egypt. And they had a Passover lamb. And, and Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 to 23, they, they talked about that the blood was applied. <clears throat> And um, you have to apply the blood. If you didn't apply the blood to the lentils, the, the, the lentil and the two side posts, and if you didn't obey and stay inside, it wouldn't have done you any good. So to know that the blood of Jesus covers sin, if you don't apply that, if you don't take that, that's not going to do anything. So blood shed makes the atonement for sins. Leviticus 17 verse 11 For the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. In Hebrews 9 22 almost all things 
are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. <coughs> now the, um, so we understand, you see, the blood has the life, and that's why sin, the penalty for sin is death, so life dies, sheds blood. <coughs> now there's the Jewish holidays, the holy days, uh, Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. So this was a mo it was the most holy day they had. And basically, once a year, they had to shed the blood to cover the sin. So Aaron offered a bullock for a sin offering for himself, and he offered a goat as a sin offering for the people, with the sins of Israel confessed over the head of the scapegoat, which was then led off into the wilderness. So there were two goats for the people. One goat was slain and the blood was shed. And the other one, Aaron would put his hands over the goat's head and confess all the sins of Israel for the year. And then it would be let go and that's where the term scapegoat, it's you blaming, oh you blame somebody, oh he, he's the scapegoat, you know, it wasn't his fault but you know, the goat, it wasn't the goat's fault but he's the scapegoat kind of thing. Uh, and it was done every year. Once a year, all the sins covered. Once a year. And so this is what was talking about, and Joel read about it in uh, Hebrews. So we come to Leviticus chapter 16, verse 34. And this shall be an everlasting statue unto you, to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. But that was a foreshadowing, and we have the real deal. The New Covenant, the New Testament. Matthew ch chapter um, 26, verse 28, Jesus is speaking. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. In Colossians 1, 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus' blood covers our sins. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. <coughs> Now, Jesus offered himself once, not yearly. And Hebrews 9, 26, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world he appeared, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And Hebrews 10, 10, by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And Isaiah 53, 11, just again, God was satisfied. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. <clears throat> now, by the law, the yearly offerings were made for sins. The sins were covered. The sins were atoned for, forgiven. But what was the problem? Because of the evil conscience, because of the sin nature, of everybody, of all those that came to bring the sacrifices, they were not made perfect by those offerings. And so next year they came with a new list of so sins to be atoned for. See? So that's the law couldn't accomplish what Jesus accomplished. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10 verses 1 to 2 says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which I just talked about, which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they, have, for then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. See, it's the conscience, it's the sin nature. They still have the evil conscience. If their evil conscience was purged, then they would have been made, what they say, they use the word perfect. <clears throat> and continuing on in Hebrews, but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bull and of goat should take away sins. Wherefore, when... He cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written to me, 
to do thy will, O God. Do you see how obedience is so central to what Jesus did? Above, when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, the old covenant, that he may establish the second, by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Then in Hebrews 10, 11 to 14, continuing, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. So he's saying sins, but it means my sin nature, your sin nature, because the sins are covered. That's why they're doing this. But it doesn't take away our sin nature, our evil conscience. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. Which speaks of, my spiritual DNA has been taken care of. I've been perfected in that now I have the spiritual DNA, just like Jesus, of God the Father. And my conscience, as we'll see, has been taken care of as well. Because Jesus' blood, it purges our consciences from, from sin so we can serve God. Hebrews 10, 15 to 17, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds and will I write them in their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And then going on, our consciences become good and pure. So you talked about the sprinkling, that before the sprinkling we have an evil conscience, but now our consciences become good and pure. Hebrews chapter nine, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? See. Our consciences are purged with, by the blood of Jesus. 1 Timothy 1.5 Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith and pain. So we have charity, love, faith, a good conscience. This is the new man in Christ. 1 Timothy 3.9 Holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. Since we're talking about consciences, I want to make it clear. I am in no way saying that Chocolate is evil and vanilla good, okay? I'm hoping dark chocolate's in heaven. It's one of my favorite. But so there's the evil conscience and then we get a pure conscience, a good conscience. <clears throat> now, this starts to touch a little bit about the Lord's Supper because you see, the old covenant was you couldn't drink blood. You weren't supposed to eat anything that had the blood in it. It was a law. It was forbidden, but this was the physical blood. You were not allowed to eat, drink of the physical blood. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 14, it says, see, for it is the life of all flesh, the blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, you shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. And cut off is you're killed. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 23. Only be sure that thou eat not, that thou eat not the blood. For the blood is the life. And thou mayest not eat the life with the flesh. But Jesus, he commands us to eat his flesh and drink his blood. You can understand why some of the Jews were like, this is a hard saying, is what they said. In John chapter 6, verses 47 to 51, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, for I will give for the life of the world. 
so there is this idea he's talking about the manna came down from heaven and what did that do? That provided nourishment, that gave them life, they could live, and the next go on. But Jesus is saying, the bread that comes down from heaven, I am that bread, and my flesh is that blood. And I'm going to give my body and my blood. John chapter 6, verses 53 to 58. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I send you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That's the Lord's Supper. Do you understand it's not doing some little ceremony? It's understanding this great salvation, what he did, what shape you were in until Jesus came and went to the cross and offered up his body of obedience his whole life and shed his blood. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. See, and it's not the physical flesh of Jesus. It's not the physical blood of Jesus that we're partaking. It's he says, this is, and he, this is my body, this is my blood. See, when he has the bread and the wine. Whoso, whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So it's this idea of Jesus, I'm totally taking you in. I'm taking your flesh, I'm taking your blood. You, you gave up your flesh for me, you shed your blood for me. I get it, I remember that. I'm waiting for you to come back. <coughs> So Jesus is the bread from heaven. His flesh is the bread he gives. Eat it and not die, but live forever. The Lord's Supper represents the offering of his body, which was killed, and his shedding of his blood, and also remembers his resurrection. <clears throat> now, Jesus obtained for us eternal life. John chapter 10, verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I'm not going into the lake of fire. I have eternal life. Jesus got it for me. John chapter 3, verse 15. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting, but have eternal life. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And John chapter 6, verse 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's part of the principles of the doctrine of Christ. There is going to be resurrection, and there's going to be, there's going to be eternal judgment. So, <clears throat> sin is horrific. It's terrible. We, we see all this terrible things going on. And realize that the wicked, they just choose the, the wickedness they want to be righteous over. They just, they go, oh, this is terrible. This should be fixed. But you see, they're doing wickedness. The sinners, sons and daughters of Satan, they're, they're all doing wickedness. And Satan wants them occupied with their own sense of justice and fixing things and this is not right so we should fix this. So they don't think about the fact that it's accounted unto man to die once and then the judgment. So that they're not focused, you know, this is why in our life things happen. You can't pay the mortgage, you lose your house. That, that can be real sad. But if you're born again, you've taken care of the big thing. <laughs> you're, you're going to heaven one day. Meanwhile, you can be serving the Lord. But the big, big question of, are you going to go into the lake of fire? Or are you going to... Has been settled. You now are in the light. 
you now can see, you now have an appreciation. Let us not have the appreciation of sin like sinners do. Well, it's not so bad. Right now is the time of grace. Right now is Satan brings condemnation, but Jesus brings life. But he doesn't minimize sin. The woman caught in adultery, he said, go and sin no more. So when we meet sinners, when we meet people who aren't born again, we have the answer. Do you realize no other religion has, an, has an, a solution for sin? Nobody. It is only the Christian religion that has the answer. It's Jesus. And this was a, a teaching on the full extent of how that was the answer for what happened. So Jesus was spiritually alive in fellowship with God. Has God the Father's spiritual DNA. He's the Son of God. He has a good conscience. So we have a great, great, great salvation. Jesus is the only one who gives this. And so we say to others, repent and believe. In two last scriptures, Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the only way. That's it. God bless you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this great salvation. Thank you for Jesus, Lord. Thank you for your mercy and your grace on us so that we had eyes to see and ears to hear. And that you knocked and we opened the door and let you in, Lord. Thank you. I just pray, Lord, that uh, those that could uh, see this at some point in the future, that this would uh, bring many to salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, hey, can you...